So first of all, welcome to everybody. Um, so my name is Christophe Longueville, and uh, today I will, uh, together with uh, Gillian Verstraten, our uh, data science expert and uh, also macroeconomic expert, we will provide you with uh, insights on uh, how current economic trends uh, are uh, affecting uh, businesses. I think that's an understatement. Um, and uh, we will also show how we can help you in uh, dealing with this uh, uncertain times through our data-driven approach with our live services. So um, before we dive into uh, these economic, these macroeconomic trends uh, and, and challenges, and then also how to cope with that or and how to help you. Um, first, let us give a small introduction on uh, the leading indicators and the approach uh, we have with it, because this is the basis of uh, our live service, our leading indicating forecasting. So, um, so Venture has developed uh, a service that is based on uh, public data, public external data, uh, but also uh, private data. Um, we have uh, a synchronized database of approximately 10 million indicators, which uh, allows us to help you in making data-driven uh, scenarios and decisions in, uh, in, in, in the current environments. What is the goal of uh, having all these indicators at our disposal? It is to help you in getting insights and visibility uh, into uh, the future. So what we are typically aiming is to help you have more visibility and understanding within a, a three to 12 months horizon, sometimes even 18 months, um, through uh, identifying leading indicators. So uh, we'll come back on the concept of leading uh, for your specific business. So we do that through uh, finding uh, and searching indicators that are relevant for your business and that, that impact your business and have predictive um, insights for you. Um, we do this with our, our team of, of experts. So um, Gillian Verstraat is leading uh, our team of data science experts and he will uh, give uh, deeper insights into current economical trends. Uh, understand that live is typically a service that gives you a tactical insight. So for three to 12 months. Um, why is it uh, leading? Uh, it is because it has a predictive value um, for the future. Typically, these indicators, um, they uh, tend to have uh, external information, which you will not find in your internal data alone. So typically, what you see on the, the right-hand graph on the top is if you would use traditional forecasting methods that they will have a tendency to just continue with uh, the trend. So, uh, and not identifying inflection points or bending points. And this is typically what uh, we are able to do with the external data. So, and in this case, leading indicators. Why are we saying leading? Leading, you will see it at the lower graph is because um, the type of indicator he has uh, a certain pattern that is three, four, five, six, or even 12 months um, already um, predicting what is going to happen with the actual yeah, target phenomenon we are trying to predict. In this case, it's a sales volume. It could also be uh, another type of, uh, let's say, a phenomenon, but there is this lack, and you see that typically in the dotted line, that is the original indicator, and then you see the time difference, the lead typically, and that can be a number of months. Um, we don't uh, use typically one indicator, but multiple indicators that we will then uh, combine into a model uh, for you then to, to build a predictive model to uh, predict the type of uh, situation scenarios that might occur in your business. So what is typically the service we are speaking about? So on the, on the left-hand side, you see the sources that we are using. Of course, we are using your own data uh, of, of the, 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 the typically lines of businesses that uh, we will uh, analyze. We combine that with, with all types of public data. So from Eurostat, from, uh, from the Fed, 
but also with uh, specific service providers such as LMC, which has a lot of data uh, on the automotive sector. It can also be like ICES, which is typically for energy, very interesting. IHS, which has also a lot of very interesting data. So these are all indicators. And, and as I said uh, in the introduction, it's, it's more than 10 million indicators. What we do with these indicators is, is set up matching process. The matching process is typically uh, a process where we will identify the indicators that are relevant for you, for your business line. So it can be automotive, can be construction, can be healthcare, can be very specific things. And we do this through a smart search, but also bringing in expert knowledge. And with that, uh, we are able to find interesting drivers for your business. Um, if you want to continue the exercise, then typically we will combine these indicators in a modeling uh, exercise. So we will make a predictive model. We, for that, we have developed specific machine learning techniques. Uh, and then we do several iterations to come to the ideal model for your type of problem. Once we have uh, set up this predictive model, we can start to go much further and develop scenarios. So we can see how indicators might evolve in the future. So, and then start to simulate also uh, the type of, of scenarios for you uh, and even going much further in the future than a couple of months with maybe 12 months, 16 months, 18 months. So you can see it as both a kind of a warning system, an early warning system, but also something that allows you to plan your business based on several scenarios and to have a data expert next to you. That's why we also say data-driven decisions based purely on, on data coming from your internal and the external world. So, um, we also provide dashboards. Uh, once we have identified uh, the indicators for your business, this is typically a dashboard, a generic dashboard for the automotive business. So where we show the long-term behavior of indicators. What you see here is the great zones example given is typically uh, occurring in recession periods. And we had the financial crisis in 2008 and 2009. We have, of course, the current uh, crisis uh, with COVID that started in 2020. What you see there is typically spikes in uh, the behavior of the indicators in these crisis periods, but you also see the trend, eh? so which is in the orange line. So you see there what is really happening on the longer term. Um, and interesting to see here is a very simple example on, uh, on, the, on the left, on the top uh, graph, you see auto inventory versus sales ratio, eh? where you see the pressure on actually uh, yeah, getting getting a new car and eh, because uh, there is apparently not so much inventory versus sales. So it's even at the lowest level in here on, in 15 years. So that's quite an interesting uh, phenomenon that we see. Um, so if we go to the next one, uh, we make a further analysis based on, on the indicators that we have identified and even for your business or for a generic uh, problem like, okay, let's uh, talk here about automotive. Um, what you see on the right hand side is how these indicators, how they evolve on a short term, uh, on a monthly basis. And if they evolve for more than 5%, we will uh, highlight them uh, in orange. On the left hand side, you also see how they behave on a long term from, from a value perspective. Um, like if you look at the left hand side, you see at the top that um, there is um, a lot of uh, inventory apparently uh, happening on, on the parts uh, in, in the automotive sector. While if you look at the, 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 the ratio, so of auto inventory versus sales, it's at the lowest in, in many years, as I said before. Um, also interesting uh, to see is you see the movements, like, okay, you see it's even degrading, uh, uh, like from uh, the month of August to the month of September, the auto inventory inventory versus sales ratio is even more under pressure, which is also kind of indicating how stringent, how, how difficult it is 
to get a new car. And it's also, everybody knows that the delivery times are actually uh, quite long currently. So this is all type of additional analysis you can expect from our side. We also update uh, the businesses uh, with uh, the relevant indicators that you want to receive on a regular basis. So once uh, we have new information, we send that directly to your mailbox or to your smartphone. Uh, and there you can have a real time insight on, on the major indicators that you want to follow with a, an automated notification from our side. And finally, as I said before, uh, we combine then uh, the indicators that we have identified uh, into one a model. Uh, typically, we use multiple indicators. It can be two, it can be five, it can be six, um, whatever is interesting. And then you can see here, like, if we apply this model, typically with, with traditional models, statistical models, it's difficult. You see here a, a benchmark with a whole winter's uh, model. Uh, it's the blue uh, it's the blue line it's not capturing uh, the trend it's because it has no information uh, if we use these external indicators you see we are capable of uh, capturing uh, the trend and then you see the dotted line versus the the, the actuals uh, which is the, the 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 other line and we see that we are able to really capture the reality uh, with a leading lack of of three to five months using two indicators in this case. So let me now uh, give the word to my colleague, to Gillian, uh, who will um, connect the current reality and how we can help you with that. So Gillian, the floor is to you. Yes, thank you, Christophe. Um, so if we want to know what is uh, currently happening, we actually have to uh, go back one year and a half to uh, the event that impacted our lives majorly uh, in that time span. So uh, when COVID-19 broke out, a lot of companies, they were in, in going into crisis mode. So typically for a company, this, this means that they ensure their cash flows uh, by reducing costs, by, for example, scaling down production, and also reducing their working capital so that they have that money free for, for emergencies. Also, if you remember, there are also a lot of discussions regarding how the recovery would be shaped, whether it would be a V-shaped, a U-shaped or an L-shaped recovery. If we then look how this uh, recovery went in reality, then we definitely see here a V-shape occurring uh, in 2020. So sales were down drastically in uh, a very short time frame, but they also recovered very, very, uh, very, very strongly, uh, very, very soon. So that means V-shaped recovery. Uh, you, if you look at the uh, financial crisis, then you, you see a more of a U-shaped recovery where, uh, where actually uh, the recovery took a longer time uh, to, to, uh, to, to, yeah, to recover, basically. Um, companies, especially upstream companies, eh, so at the bottom of the slide, you can see a typical supply chain uh, going from uh, the downstream uh, a consumer to retail store uh, more upstream and then several upstream manufacturers, uh, which are all delivering goods to one another. Um, if you're uh, starting to see recovery signals, then uh, typically, at, if you start seeing these, these signals at the retail store, then typically it can take uh, quite some time before you can see them on uh, further upstream in the supply chain. So uh, also manufacturers, uh, if they want to scale up production, they want to be sure that the recovery is uh, actually taking place, that it's not a, a temporary uplift. So that's why recovery could take more uh, uh, longer and led to a lot of hurdles in starting up supply chains uh, when we starting up from the from the COVID uh, downturn. So the current uh, uh, hurdles they are both demand and supply uh, uh, 
constraint or uh, related to supply and demand problems. Uh, there was a recent article on CBS News uh, around that a lot of important items were not going to be available for the 21 holiday season. So these are all related to, uh, to, uh, to supply and demand problems. Um, basically, if you look at supply, there is uh, insufficient supply all across the board, practically. We're seeing shortages. Uh, we've already talked a little bit on, this, on the chip shortage, semiconductor shortage. Uh, and we'll go deeper into that uh, at a later stage in the presentation. There's also uh, supply issues related to COVID and uh, supply issues related to uh, shipping, both in lead times and in costs. And we'll also dig into that deeper at a later stage. If you look at the demand side, we are actually currently seeing a very high demand uh, for, for items. Well, there often the question is also raised, is this demand real? Uh, we all remember when uh, COVID hit us in March uh, of 2020 that there was a toilet paper shortage, which uh, create a buying frenzy for toilet paper. Uh, it could be that the, the high demand is also due to that, and that companies, they are afraid that the sh shortage might impact their production and they uh, actually are ordering more to ensure that they have uh, supply. So uh, the economic law of uh, supply and demand uh, states that if, you know, if you have insufficient supply and a very high demand, then typically you will see price increases, which is also uh, something, uh, is also a topic that has been very hot lately and has been in the news. So if we then, zoom into uh, the chip shortages. Let's start by looking at the industry which has been in the news uh, the most, I think, related to the semiconductor shortage, uh, the automotive industry. So uh, automotive industry is very heavily hit uh, by the semiconductor shortage. Why is that? Well, when the pandemic bro broke out and we were all expecting that the pandemic was going to take a lot longer than, than we expected. Uh, manufacturing companies, auto producers, they postponed their production, postponed uh, their orders to their suppliers. And this ripple effect went through the, to the, up to the, the manufacturers of semiconductors were happily to give that uh, production slots to other uh, types of goods, such as all the items we needed during the uh, pandemic, eh? laptops, screens, uh, gaming consoles, and so forth. Um, however, when, uh, when the recovery was uh, occurring more uh, or stronger than what we expected, then of course those production slots, they were already gone. So uh, this is really creating a shortage, which is still happening uh, now. So what we see here is on the slide is that vehicle sales and vehicle production is at a very, very low level. Um, we see that uh, during the COVID pandemic, there has been a very uh, hard shock in the vehicle sales in the US, followed by a very strong uplift but now due to the semiconductor shortage, the vehicle sales are actually down a lot again, simply because uh, OEMs cannot finish, cannot uh, assemble their cars. We also see a similar um, effect occurring in the EU, where uh, there has been a very strong rebound at the end of 2020, followed by a gradual decline again during 21 uh, as, the OEMs couldn't assemble cars. This has uh, drastically impact the price of used vehicles, as you can see on the right at the bottom right. Um, the price of used vehicles has basically increased, uh, or increased by 50% uh, since the start of the year. So a uh, very drastic uh, increase in price. Uh, why is that? There's few, uh, new autos going into the, the market. 
So uh, demand for used vehicles is increasing uh, and this drives up the price. If you then look at broader industries, uh, uh, there's many industries currently impacted uh, by uh, the semiconductor shortage. Uh, there's shortages in uh, medical equipment who often require specialized chips, uh, computers, uh, CPUs and GPUs, so high tech components, as you can see on this graph. Um, also gaming consoles, for example, and bikes are uh, sometimes difficult to assemble at the moment. Um, so in this graph, you basically see uh, the price evolution of the two leading brands of GPUs, so AMD and NVIDIA. And you see the price evolution as uh, the percentage of the manufacturer's suggested retail price. So what we, what we, what we immediately see is that this uh, price seems to be going in an increasing trend, which is not the typical trend you see in such an environment where if a new chip is being released, then uh, its demand is a lot higher than the supply. Well, in a later stadium, supply typically catches up and drives down the price uh, and makes that type of high tech component more available to, to the broader audience. What we are currently seeing is that it's actually increasing in price, uh, and this is driven by this, that shortage in, uh, in semiconductors. What's also very interesting is that you can see in this graph is that the availability is uh, fluctuating very strongly. Uh, and this seems to be also linked to the price of uh, certain cryptocurrencies, um, where uh, those uh, type of high tech components are also used to mine that uh, that cryptocurrency. So um, that's impacting the, the availability of the, those components and uh, ultimately affecting the price. What are companies doing to, uh, to, to try to tackle that uh, issue? As they are evolving into in house chip development. So, uh, over the past years, uh, Tesla and Apple have been doing that. And so Tesla has started to design their own chips. Apple has also uh, removed uh, their uh, part of their chip production in-house. For example, their, their CPUs are now based on, on their own designs before they were using Intel designs. However, you can see that still uh, Apple is experiencing problems uh, with the chips that they don't design. Um, and that's actually uh, reducing their supply of iPhones uh, in the co next com coming months. Ford and GM are also evolving into that uh, space. And they are also getting ready to design their own chips. Um, and with design, you, you see that they actually are designing the chip. However, they are still not uh, physically producing that chip themselves. Uh, for Intel, we see a totally different, different story. Intel uh, historically has been producing their own chips, so designing and producing that is. They had difficulties historically with uh, keeping up with the uh, chip uh, development process. They started outsourcing uh, their, their chip manufacturing and are now actually doing the inverse and restarting their own production and catching up on that uh, production process. So that's a very interesting trend uh, for, the, for the next couple of years. So then the next topic is uh, COVID and transportation issues. So um, we've all noticed that it's also getting increasingly difficult to uh, getting supplies. Uh, and this is uh, basically due to three uh, different uh, reasons. So first reason is the local COVID outbreaks. Uh, we recently only had the Omicron variant uh, getting uh, spread around the globe. Uh, and what happens then? Well, uh, a lot of co countries, they, they block uh, 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 yeah, shipping from, from one re region to another. So they block flights from one region to another, uh, which makes it increasingly difficult to, uh, to ship from one region to another. 
there's been also some outbreaks in uh, major transportation hubs. Uh, uh, Southern China has, uh, over the past couple of months, uh, received some COVID outbreaks, which has led to parts of that region going into lockdown. And of course, a lot of the ports which are supplying the US and uh, Europe with goods are uh, located in that area. So that's heavily impacting uh, shipments. And also, um, yeah, uh, major manufacturing hubs are very important. For example, Taiwan is very important for semiconductors. Um, and that's also uh, getting increasingly difficult. Um, all that increases shipping durations. Yeah? So it's taking also uh, longer to ship goods from one region to another, partly due to COVID, partly due to high demand. And that's becoming very uh, visible in shipping costs. So at the bottom of the slide, you see two graphs comparing uh, shipping costs. On the left, you see the Baltic Freight Toss Index, uh, which is an index regarding the price of uh, containers, so from shipping containers from one region to another. This has increased uh, twofold or more over the past year. So that's a, a very dramatic increase. At the right, you see the Baltic Dry Index, which is an indicator that we suggested to follow uh, to monitor economic recovery. Um, we see that this trend or this indicator has, uh, has decreased considerably over the past couple of months. Uh, and this is due that uh, due to the fact that the Baltic Dry Index is uh, for is an indicator for monitoring the shipment of dry goods such as iron ore and and so forth from one region to another. So um, this is actually down because uh, China is curtailing some of that production in uh, in in China. And uh, a final impact of uh, transportation issues is driver shortage. So currently, a lot of regions are seeing driver shortages. Uh, the, the, the strongest driver shortage we've seen was in the UK a couple of months ago, where uh, there was a gasoline shortage due to driver, uh, a driver shortage in, in the market. So it was very difficult to fill your car up with gasoline. So how has this impacted? Um, well, if you look at the, the left graph, yeah, we see the global manufacturing PMI uh, input prices. This, uh, the input prices, so the, the prices for, uh, to get your goods to your factories is uh, currently on the highest level in a decade. Yeah. So previous peaks are caused by uh, the oil price spike uh, before the financial crisis, as well as the uh, Japan tsunami uh, 10 years ago. So currently we are not seeing the same excessive uh, oil prices as, uh, as back then when oil hit $150 for a barrel. Uh, so what, what we are currently seeing, as I've stated uh, a couple of slides ago, is, is actually uh, we're seeing a lot of those uh, supply lead times growing, similarly to what we've seen with the tsunami. But uh, yeah, no, it's uh, even more difficult, I would say. And that can be seen at the two other lines. Eh? So we see the uh, delivery times increasing. So that's the dark green line. And in the light green line, we see also uh, that the demand has been exceptionally high on the past couple of uh, months. What's also striking is if you look at the right, you basically see that um, the uh, supplier performance, so getting your goods in time to, the, to your clients has been uh, decreasing, has been worsening across the board for the whole world. So we see a lot of uh, countries that are being monitored all seeing decreases uh, and it's also ranging all over the board, developed nations, developing nations, Asia, US, North America, uh, Europe, uh, all regions are basically seeing deteriorated, deteriorating performance. 
and of course uh, those uh, or the, those price increases they are being passed on to the to, to the consumers and so uh, recent uh, readings have been uh, of consumer price index in the US um, compared to the previous year has seen an increase of 4.6 percent uh, where the central bank typically has a target of around 2%. So basically, uh, inflation is ranging in uh, the US, but we see a similar evolution also in the Eurozone. So this high consumer price index that's creating uh, problems, problems for uh, consumers, and everything is getting more expensive, but will also uh, impact business because central banks, they conduct their mon monetary policy based on uh, employment and on stable prices. Uh, the target typically there 2% uh, for the de developed nations. So if there's high inflation, um, typically central banks will uh, adopt a more contractionary policy uh, to keep that inflation in check and reduce the money supply in, uh, in the market. However, as the pandemic is still not over, they're still also trying to expand the employment. So that's creating kind of a conflictory uh, environment for central banks. And really the, the real horror uh, scenario is, uh, is stagflation, right? So that means that your economy is no longer growing but uh, your inflation is uh, at the high side. What monetary, monetary policy also has uh, an impact on is on exchange rates. And so exchange rates uh, we see here is the euro to dollar exchange rate. At the start of the pandemic, uh, the Fed has been more accommodative than, uh, for example, the ECB which has devalued or devalued, weakened the dollar compared to the euro over the uh, second half of 2020 and the start of 21. However, the Federal Reserve has now started to, to, to build off to taper uh, their asset purchases, which leads to uh, a, dev a revaluation of the dollar compared to the euro. Uh, which might also impact your business uh, in 22. And then a final, um, um, a final factor that will be uh, very influential to your business uh, in 2022 is energy prices. So we've already seen major cost increases due to the supply shortages and the, the high uh, demand. If uh, now, for example, more energy prices uh, or energy prices are continuing to increase, that, that will continue uh, increasing prices of goods, transportation costs. So that could uh, very well uh, yeah, re reduce prices even further and have impact on, on, your, on your businesses in the next coming months. So the question is then, what can you do about it? Well, we have uh, many, many uh, possible uh, solutions that you can do about this. So we've split them a bit in supply and demand um, uh, solutions or uh, opportunities. And the first one is to monitor your orders. So as I stated, we are currently all seeing high demand it's very interesting to monitor how that demand, how those orders are evolving. If you see uh, customers canceling orders, if you see, then it's good to, to, uh, to discuss that, to think, okay, are we seeing so something occurring? Are we seeing a turning point coming up? Is all the demand that we have in our orders books, is that real demand? Um, what we also can uh, do about it, is um, you can monitor your upstream value chain. What do we mean by that? I'll go back to that later, but you can monitor how the demand is evolving upstream and the supply chain so that if you can, if there is a turning point occurring, 
you can uh, you can capture it before it's occurring in your sales and you can adapt to it. What's also very interesting there is uh, monitoring inventories upstream. Eh? If we see inventories building up uh, upstream, then typically that could be a case or can, could make a case that demand is going to decrease uh, for you uh, if the demand does not follow further upstream in the supply chain. It's also very interesting to monitor is price evolutions. So um, price evolutions might uh, be driven by the demand or by the supply of certain goods, as I've stated with the used cars. Um, a next step which we could do is uh, we could uh, integrate uh, predictive models, which could predict your business trends uh, for the future. Um, so typically your business is impacted by various uh, business drivers. So if you can identify leading drivers for your business and combine them in a forecast model, then um, you could uh, detect turning points uh, occurring up front. What you can do for from the supply chain is uh, monitor the behavior of key raw materials and semi-finished goods. So for example, you can monitor uh, the evolution in the lead times, monitor uh, price evolutions there. And then the final part, it's very important to uh, make scenarios on the demand side, on the cost side, and uh, for your margin uh, for the future. So I've um, thought that we uh, could, uh, or that one of the possible solutions is to monitor uh, upstream value chain evolutions. How could you do that? Well, we have developed dashboards that allow you to monitor uh, the evolutions further upstream in your, in your supply chain or value chain. So for example, hey, if you're an automotive producer, which, which is very far upstream, then typically there might be uh, other manufacturers that you supply to. Eventually you'll end up at a tier one, which supplies the parts for uh, the, the, the vehicle to manufacture the vehicle. Then we have the OEM who assembles the, the, the vehicle who sells the vehicle to the dealership and the dealership sells it to the consumer. So we could look at how proxies, and so uh, what is a proxy? It's uh, an indicator that measures uh, and the behavior of a very uh, difficult to of observe variable. Uh, so one proxy, for example, for car dealers is the vehicle sales. Vehicle sales um is uh, basic is basically the evolution of uh sales of vehicles to the consumer we have other proxies further upstream for example motor vehicle assemblies for uh vehicle manufacturers industrial production for vehicle uh parts uh for the to ones and then for auto parts and allied goods for further upstream so you could monitor the evolution of those uh, those proxies in a, in a dashboard. So uh, one dashboard is, for example, monitoring the demand of those indicators. Uh, and what we see here, and it's very interesting, those indicators, they have all been uh, very well in sync before COVID, so before the green space. And after the uh, green or the sorry the gray space, you basically see that the indicators are no longer in sync. And we see first see uh, the production and the assemblies picking up. Then afterwards, the sales are picking up. Sales are then at a very high level at the start of this year, whereas the production could not follow, and now sales are falling back to 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 lower levels basically. What's also very interesting to monitor is inventories. So for vehicles, uh, we see here that uh, the inventory of uh, finished vehicles, so that's the green line, is uh, deteriorating very rapidly. So it's uh, at a very low, whereas the inventories for parts, for parts has 
searched over the past couple of months. So this is creating really a discrepancy and is showing you that, well, there's a lot of automotive parts in the supply chain, but they are not being assembled into, into cars, into finished cars. And then finally, our graph with the consumer price level. And so we see that semiconductor shortage is uh, skyrocketing the price of used cars. So what we also would expect is if that semiconductor shortage is uh, decreasing, is uh, neutralizing, uh, then we would expect the price for the used cars to, to fall back to lower levels. We've also talked about uh, creating scenarios on your sales, and those are particularly interesting to combine with a forecasting model. So if your forecasting model is, for example, uh, the model which we showed at the beginning of the presentation, combination of vehicle sales and consumer confidence, then we could create uh, indicator scenarios on, uh, on our indicators. So for example, vehicle sales, you could create um, scenarios based on the historical uncertainty of that indicator. So basically looking how, uh, how do we expect those, uh, uh, the indicator behavior to evolve based on the historical uncertainty. Or we could create those scenarios based on uh, expert input. And that expert input can, for example, be uh, sales, or for example, marketing of your firm, or maybe you can uh, get some industry insights uh, in industry outlook reports. And then using leading indicator forecast models, you could uh, run those scenarios through your leading indicator forecast and see how, that, how they impact uh, the sales. So, uh, that's uh, what I wanted to tell uh, to you today. Um, I'm giving the word back to Christophe for uh, the conclusion and the Q&A. Yep. So uh, first of all, thanks, uh, Gillian, for for yeah, making the connection between yeah the actual let's say lot of lot lots of disruptions that that we see, but also um, bringing a clarity in 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 how all this is interconnected um, because sometimes I think it's it's very confusing. Um, but at the same time, if, if you think about it and do some deep diving as, as you did, there's a lot of logic behind it, not always very nice to hear. But uh, so there's a lot of explanation and a lot of information um, being provided by just yeah looking at, at the right indicators, first of all. So if, if we could move to, to the next slide. So um, first of all, so so uh, what uh, we've seen is there's a lot of imbalance uh, going on. Eh? So that that was illustrated also by these long lead times that occur. Uh, and then uh, if you look at the value change, typically, uh, which is very interesting, like for the automotive sector, then you start to understand what is really happening because it's not necessarily demand that is very high. You see also inventories that are um, pulling up and, and, and getting bigger in, 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 the, in the value chain. Um, so all types of phenomena uh, that are well illustrated with uh, a lot of visualizations that we can make and, and, and models that we can build and then also related uh, business scenarios. Um, so I, I hope that from our side, we could uh, share with you the type of analysis uh, we can we can make for your business, but also uh, the type of, of very standard information like by just providing you with the indicator evolution gives already a lot of, of insight. Um, we had a couple of, of questions uh, wondering if we also monitor uh, commodity prices uh, like, like oil, gas, uh, coffee, uh, gold, so all types of commodities. And uh, if we see some, some correlations there and, and even with some uh, stock prices of related companies. Um, of course, that's, that's an interesting question. Sometimes it's a, a $1 million question, but 
On the other hand, I think if, uh, of course, not on the short term, because we uh, are certainly unable to uh, do predictions about short term stock evolutions. Uh, but what uh, is indeed uh, be interesting is uh, to look at the long term or the midterm stock evolution and, and the impact of certain indicators indeed on it, uh, because there could be uh, value uh, in, in included of these external commodity indicators. I also had a, a question for you, uh, Gillian, that came through the chatbot and was like uh, related to the semiconductor uh, story. If you had some visibility or some assessment about yeah, how long you expect this going to continue uh, because it's quite a, a strange phenomenon. Yes, thank you, Christophe. That's uh, again another one million dollar question, I believe. Um, the I, I I think yeah, there's there's two parts eh, to that question. First of all, there's uh, there's not enough semiconductor plants and eh, fabs as we call them to provide all the semiconductors uh, the whole industry needs. So that's uh, that's that's an an evolution that's going to impact us, I think, for the next couple of years, as creating or building those factories that's not built in a day. That's that's an exercise of years. However, as we're seeing uh, in the in the presentation, uh, companies they are uh, adapting to it. They are designing their own chips, and they are then going to to semiconductor producers. Uh, TSMCs and others, global foundries of the world, uh, which produce those chips for them. Eh? And if you, you're, you're basically designing your chips yourselves, it's of course easier to go to, to uh, or to do the multiple sourcing, to, to go to multiple semiconductor producers uh, to, to create your chips. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that, that will, I think, uh, improve the situation in the near future. Also for automotive, eh, uh, once they, they get more order slots from, from those companies, I think uh, that shortage will ease more for the, for the automotive sector. Okay, thanks uh, for that. Um, another question uh, I had was uh, about a uh, margin squeeze. So you were uh, mentioning, uh, yeah, the, the pressure on, on let's say the, the end prices uh, for, for consumers, which is ultimately uh, translated into this inflation pressure you see both in the US uh, in, in, in Europe. On the other hand, uh, companies uh, where you said, yeah, you have these, these lead times, uh, so the difficulties in getting uh, delivered at the right time, um, but also being faced with uh, raw material uh, or semi-finished goods uh, price issues. Um, so margin squeeze, uh, somebody was asking, yeah, oh, how, how do you expect companies will, will have to live with that because they will maybe not be able also to translate all these price pressure on their cost sides towards the consumer because at some point maybe it will be just too much for the consumer. Yes, that's uh, an excellent point that you're making. Eh? Um, uh, there's two parts to that question, I think. Eh? Uh, there's, a, there's the, the part of, are you going to be able to, uh, to, to pass on the costs to, the, to further up in the supply chain, either to your, your client or to the consumer? So that's one part of the question. And the other part of the question is, how are your costs going to evolve? And that's, that's, I think, the main part of that. And there you can, that's also something that we have done before, and we can or you can also do it, I think. Uh, but what you can do is you can create a model that will uh, take into account or either the actual value of that, of the raw materials that you require or a forecast. And for example, for oil price, if that's one of your key raw materials, um, there's forecasts available for that by organizations. So you could use that into a cost of goods sold model. Uh, and then see how much your cost of goods sold will be for you for the next year. And then ultimately, uh, if you can pause out the costs to your, to your clients, 
you need to know, uh, you can basically calculate your profit already. Okay, a great, great answer. One last question uh, we had is, can you give uh, yeah, a, 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 an example of a service that you're currently applying uh, for a customer uh, yeah, using this type of, of value chain analysis? What can you share about it and, and how are uh, these customers using it in their monthly or, or daily processes? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Uh, so I think these kinds of uh, dashboards, for example, and uh, also uh, the indicator email, for example, they are very uh, convenient for, for, for firms which are upstream in supply chain, who do not have any uh, strong connection with a consumer behavior. Uh, you're, if you're, for example, very upstream in automotive, yeah, by the time you see uh, the order pattern uh, changing in your sales, it's already too late to do something about it. If you can monitor how vehicle sales, vehicle production, vehicle inventories, and so forth are evolving uh, at your upstream part, then basically you already have an overview of how uh, your business is going to evolve. Yeah. And you see a change then in uh, also uh, the adoption of the business leaders in, in, in a business unit or also people from, from marketing intelligence or from the sales side that uh, really are now um, trusting your type of analysis um, and, and also yeah, uh, getting new insights because if they use their intuition, maybe it's, it's contraintuitive sometimes what, what you bring on the table. Yeah, it's, it can be very confusing in the sense that if you see a downturn occurring in vehicle sales or vehicle production, and for example, and you see your order book increasing, what are you going to believe? That's a, that's a very difficult uh, question. But in the end, I think it all boils down how the consumer reacts, right? If the consumer is not buying anymore, then your increase will end at some point, for example. Yeah, so uh, maybe to conclude, it is, uh, we advise to have really a data-driven expert next to you. So uh, especially in these uh, times where uh, it's sometimes very confusing on, on how markets uh, are evolving, commodity markets, uh, end markets, uh, the prices are uh, going in, in, in many directions and are getting higher. But uh, so we have methodologies, uh, services and, and, and consultants that can help you with that in bringing order into how to understand what's happening in your business and also giving you insights in how it impacts your business and better understanding the drivers of it. So I hope uh, that uh, we could bring some clarity with the approach we could help you with. And please do not hesitate to uh, contact us.